So we are live, and I have Dr. Hirschberger here. Uh, wave, Dr. Hirschberger, and he is going to kind of give us the uh, the introduction to the piece of music that we're going to do. And in the meantime, I'm going to find that piece of music that somehow got lost on me. Oh, there it is. Oh, so it shows out to begin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, welcome everybody. Hope, we hope that you enjoy this uh, sort of fun time together. We're going to enjoy a piece of music and do some uh, listening and thinking about a great piece of music. Uh, Bishop Folda tells me that this is one of his favorite symphonic movements. So uh, that was sort of a serendipitous thing that happened when we talked about it. So, but I think since this is the virtual cocktail hour, uh, I think it might be good for us to actually begin by all of us taking a simultaneous sip. Shall we do it? One, two, three. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yum, boy. Very good. Mm. While you're at it, why don't you all introduce yourself and wave real good so the camera goes over to you because it's just on me and Dr. Hirschberger right now. Bishop Folda right here. Patrick McGuire, Director of Choral Activities at Shanley High School and Sullivan Middle School. All right. Well, the piece that we're going to listen to is the final movement of Symphony Number no. 2 in D major by Johannes Brahms. Brahms, of course, was a 19th century German composer. He actually spent most of his uh, career as a composer in Vienna. And this particular symphony uh, was written and premiered in 1877. It was premiered by the Vienna Philharmonic. Interestingly enough, the performance you're going to hear this evening is uh, by the Vienna Philharmonic, and uh, the conductor is named Carlos Kleiber. Now, I will have a few things to say about him afterwards, but I think it's probably just best for you to experience his conducting because it is uh, rather unusual, shall we say, and I think you will find it entertaining as well as this glorious uh, finale. Two things for you to listen for. Uh, there are two big basic themes in this symphony. One, right at the beginning, it begins very softly in the strings, and then uh, uh, the full orchestra comes in. And just uh, maybe a minute to, uh, or so later, a second theme comes in. And these two themes are the basis upon which he uh, uh, writes this uh, symphony. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is pay attention to the enthusiasm in which the players of the Vienna Philharmonic commit themselves to this performance. It's really one of the best musical and visual performance of this music uh, that you will ever encounter. I hope you enjoy it. 29, Oh, wait a minute, I think that's the third movement. All right, here's the fourth movement. We have sound.
Okay, are we back? Boy, we got some difficulties here. All right, I think we're back in the game. Are we live? We are live. Oh, all right. So, excellent. What a performance. Uh, and I hope you all noticed both uh, just how engaged the conductor was as well as the, the musicians. Uh, one of the great pieces of orchestral literature uh, under one of the great conductors and one of the great orchestras. Anybody else want to say something before we launch into some anecdotes and some things about this? One of the things that I recall about that piece, the entire Symphony. Second, Symphony second Symphony of Brahms was written after, obviously, after the first symphony. Brahms' first symphony was a little bit more solemn, um, yep. didn't get quite a, a, a positive reception, if I remember correctly. Brahms went into the country and spent some time just out in the country, out in nature, um, spent some time listening and, and just taking in uh, the beauty of creation. And he wrote this symphony. And, you know, we just heard the, the final movement, the fourth of the four movements. <clears throat> the opening movement just is, is beautiful and serene and peaceful. And it just really expresses the beauty of creation but this last movement that you just heard is the exuberance, the, the power, the magnificence of creation. And I have a feeling that's why Dr. Hirschberger chose it. Uh, but I'm gonna let him speak to that. But as he said, uh, it is one of my favorite pieces of symphonic music and uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. Yeah. Uh, Brahms uh, was what we refer to in music history in the 19th century as the arch conservative composer uh, because he took as his mantle Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven's shadow loomed so incredibly big in the 19th century. Almost every composer at some point felt that shadow. Of course, many of them assumed that they themselves were the inheritors of that mantle. But Brahms, probably more than anybody else, carried on the tradition of, of Beethoven into uh, the, the latter half of the 19th century. In fact, uh, the Brahms symphonies, he, he composed them rather later in life. His first symphony was composed when he was 54. He had such a, almost a phobia about writing a symphony because of Beethoven's ninth symphony, everybody knows the joyful, joyful, we adore thee from the Ninth Symphony. And he finally uh, broke the mold with the, the First Symphony and then wrote four total. Um, and his symphonies were sort of uh, 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 named Beethoven's Tenth, as it were, right? <laughs> um, a little bit about uh, the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, the Vienna Philharmonic is one of the oldest orchestras in existence, and it was the orchestra that premiered not only this symphony, but most of the symphonic works that Brahms wrote, as well as uh, the later symphonies of, of Beethoven. So it's a very, very old and distinguished organization. And so these musicians know this literature incredibly. They've played it hundreds and hundreds of times. And one of the interesting anecdotes about this particular form, performance that you saw uh, is that uh, after, a week after this particular performance, the Vienna Philharmonic was slated to record all four Brahms symphonies with the American conductor Leonard Bernstein. And this was in the middle 80s uh, when this took place. Now, Bernstein expressed real frustration with the orchestra when recording the second symphony because they were so enthralled with the interpretation that Carlos Kleiber had given them that Bernstein had a terrible time trying to get them to do things his way because they just couldn't get it out of, of their heads how Kleiber had, had uh, drawn that interpretation out of them. And I hope you noticed just how uh, committed they were in all of the, 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 the body language and vigor with which they played uh, musically. Now, Kleiber himself is a very interesting and, and as you can tell from his conducting, a very eccentric conductor. Um, he was sought all over Europe in the second half of the 20th century, especially from the 60s on, but no orchestra could land him as their conductor. 
because he just he didn't always want to conduct. He, he once said, I only conduct when I'm hungry. <laughs> and uh, there are so many anecdotes about him, uh, one of which is that he did decide he wanted to conduct. So he let his manager know that he wanted to conduct. The manager put the word out and they got on a conference call with all of the executive directors of all of the big orchestras in Europe and basically had an auction and he, Kleiber went to the highest bidder. Uh -huh. and, and then the tickets would sell out immediately because everybody wanted to, to hear and see Kleiber conduct. As you can tell, he is a, a very, very uh, uh, exotic and, and um, any, uh, 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 eccentric conductor. He doesn't conduct beats the way we in our church choirs or school choirs or, uh, and bands conduct because uh, they need to follow the beat. Vienna Philharmonic could play this music without a conductor, so he choreographed it and uh, uh, really drew out just a magnificent and wonderful performance, as you could hear from the, the reaction to, uh, to the audience. I have a question for uh, my colleagues, is, is what is it about this music uh, that, that causes us to just be drawn in? What do you think? Patrick, what do you think? Right away, if you know anything about the symphonic form, and you know anything about Brahms, the fact that he stuck to such a, a perfect, if you will, symphonic form for his day and age as a romantic composer, kind of hearkening back a little bit to Beethoven is quite striking. But the form works really well in the classical musical style. And the way that he goes about it in the other three movements is, is phenomenal. Um, but I, I think for, for Brahms, he really caught on to the spirit of Beethoven in the idea of contrast which is particularly striking for me. It's one of my favorite musical elements to, to bring in. And, and the way that he provides contrast in the soft sections that suddenly jump out at you as, as forte and they're soft and they're slow. And then they're super fast and they're engaging. So the, the, the engagement as a listener right away is I think what sticks out to me is something that draws me in because you just don't know what's gonna happen next. You're excited, you're anticipating it and that feels really good. I think the thing that jumps out to me about this particular piece is joy. Uh, it, there's just a joyfulness and exuberance about this piece of music, um, especially this fourth movement. You know, the rest of it is maybe not quite so rousing, but there's just a, a joy about life in this particular piece of music that the audience didn't find in his, his other symphony, but in this one, that they loved it. They loved it, and and that's why I told Dr. Hirschberger that it's one of my favorites because there's just a first a, a more quiet, a more serene joy about it. But certainly in this last movement, um, you know, he blows the roof off the place, and and uh, it's just a lot of fun to listen to. I think not all of Brahms is like that. You know, some of it is very, very uh, peaceful, very serene, very sometimes somber. I, you know, I play a little bit of Brahms on the piano. I mentioned to you before that I, I still play the piano, but I also play the trumpet. And that last minute of this movement, <laughs> I, would, I would kill to be in the trumpet section of that orchestra to play that final minute of this symphony. It just, it just gives me goosebumps it's every a, time I hear it. It's such a great moment. It's, it's just you get to blast, you get to have fun. Right. And if you notice Kleiber's uh, 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 gesture at that point, he just pointed the stick at them and just let them loose. Let them, and boy, let did, they, did they blow the roof off. Um, if I can say before uh, you go on, Dr. Hirschberger, I think this uh, music is uh, beautiful, you know, if I, if I may say so. I think there's a beauty about it you know, in my talk a little while ago, in my reflections, I was talking about the beauty that points to the infinite. Um, I think when you hear, when you participate in music with this kind of beauty, this kind of uh, sublimity, um, you can't help but experience something of the infinite beauty of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I was going to add as well that one of the things I was reading up on is got ready for all of this is just as Bishop Holden was saying, this symphony was composed in a little summer retreat 
where Brahms was at. And this first symphony he composed, like, as you say, was kind of everything in the shadow of Beethoven. Don't touch the symphony. Like Beethoven killed it. You know, we, we can't touch that now. And his first symphony was not met with great acclaim. And it took him forever to compose it. But this particular work, out in this beautiful countryside where things were great, out looking a, a beautiful lake home, he wrote it in one summer. Whereas the first symphony, he had spent so much time laboring over it, trying to get it just right. And he sent it to a friend of his, who was an amateur pianist, and he played through it. And his remark back to Brahms was, how beautiful it must be out there if you're writing this kind of music. And so very much the romantic ideal of the time is that it, it, it's all about taking what's around you and, and what you feel and the, the sensations of the world around you, putting that into musical thought. It's, it's beautifully articulated in this piece, and much like you say to the, the beauty of God's creation in particular in this circumstance. You know, if we if we think about um, the fact that God gave us a universe of order, right? The the, the 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 universe was created, and there's great order in it from the the, the movement of the interstellar uh, bodies all the way down to the the uh, atoms and the, the, the biological systems that uh, even down to the smallest. Uh, uh, ecosystems in, in a slough in, in, in rural Minnesota. There's an order to it. Music uh, reflects order, uh, and this, this is a good example of, of orderliness in music where you have themes that come about and they interplay with each other. And there are movements in keys from, from maybe D major to A major to G major or even minor, B minor, or some of the other keys. And then the same themes return again, and then they're all kind of tied up in a bow in a, in a, in a package. That order it, uh, uh, is a reflection of the human creativity that God has put in each of us. Uh, and he has gifted some of us with, with uh, musical gifts. He's get, uh, gifted some of us with engineering gifts. All of this in many ways is, is a, a, a reflection of uh, God's creativity. J.R. Tolkien talked about sub-creation, that human beings have the ability to sub-create, which is why he could come up with uh, an, a whole world and universe, secondary universe, that was so convincing that many of us say, boy, I'd really like to go to Middle Earth. <laughs> and I, I would love to have heard uh, uh, the, the premiere of the symphony, for, uh, for example. Um, and I think that, that this kind of music really leads us to that uh, transcendence. I loved, uh, Bishop, your comment uh, in your uh, presentation uh, from Dostoevsky, um, that, that if truth and goodness were banished, beauty would save uh, the world. And I think music like this really is so, in, in some ways, evangelistic. Uh, and even non-believers when hearing this kind of music, uh, many of them will say, there's something about this music that I can't explain. Uh, it, it, it draws me out and makes me think of, of, and they'll even sometimes use the word transcendent things. Uh, it's very, very much uh, in the warp and woof of what it means to be human is to, is to create because God gave us the ability to create. Billy Joel once said, nobody hears music and feels nothing. It doesn't matter if you like it or not or whatever, but you feel something when you hear music. And one of the things I talk about with my students at Shanley is that music is such an important uh, subject for us to study at school, but also to practice because it's not important. As human beings, we don't need music to survive. We don't, we don't need it like we need food and water. And what makes us uniquely human is the ability to create art. And that's why it's so important to us is because we can create. And one of the great ways that we give back to our creator is through this art form, music, it's one of the best ways we can. We hear the, the adage, to sing is to pray twice. Everything seems to be elevated when music is involved. Mm -hmm. It's a special part of our creation and our special dignity as human persons to take that and, and to refine it, make it as, as good as we possibly can and, and, and offer it back to, to God. It, it's one of the reasons why in this current sort of pandemic that we're in is that people are, they're starving. For, for live music. That's why Bishop gets the question about when do we get to sing again? Well, uh, professional musicians are all asking, when do we get to play again? Um, the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony, which I'm a member, 
we just did a, a, a weeks long rehearsal of a chamber arrangement of, of Mahler Symphony Number no. 4, but we were all socially distanced on stage. We had our masks on and we didn't have an audience. We recorded it. And, and all of us musicians were just, were frustrated because part of music, music requires both the musician and the listener. Music really is not complete if you don't have both because musicians wish to, to give and listeners wish to receive. And there's something about that that I think also is a reflection of, of, of how God interacts with us is that, is that he, is, he is the giver and we, are, uh, we receive from him, we receive our graces, we receive blessings, protection, all of, all of the wonderful aspects of our faith. And it's reflected in a concert with musicians and audience. And you know, it doesn't matter whether or not the musicians or the audience are Christian believers. It's something that we share in common. But that commonness also points us in the direction of God. They've done studies, in fact, on that, where they've recorded music with an audience and then without. And the difference between the recordings with people in the audience listening and interacting with that, even if they're just silent passive listeners, they found was to be quite profound and having a live audience to share that with means something. Mm -hmm. There's a, a passage from Augustine, again, who wrote about God as conducting the, the different uh, members of the, the kingdom who all contribute in a certain way to the, the sound of the, of the heavenly music that is produced and God himself as a conductor. So I've always loved that passage. It's in the Liturgy of the Hours, for those of you who, who uh, read the Liturgy of the Hours. There's a, a reading, one of those second readings from Augustine speaks of that image of God as the divine conductor. And I think that um, you can kind of imagine that, you know, watching Cliver conduct this <laughs> symphony tonight, he owned that orchestra, you know, he was in complete control, but each one of those members of the orchestra was, you know, a free acting person mm -hmm. and they were watching every move he made. And sometimes his move, his direction was more subtle, you know, for amateurs like me, it would be like, what is he one of us? <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, um, you know, they, they all were, in harmony and, and he was guiding them and they were following his lead. And I think that's what we're called to do as well. So, so we got a question, um, yeah. maybe maybe for Patrick. Um, why was the cocktail chosen to, <laughs> to accompany this piece? There's the cocktail. <laughs> right, yeah, it's delicious by the way. I'm just loving it so far, it's wonderful. Well, one of the things for me is that I was looking at the, the music for the, the, the score for this particular symphony and the movement. And what strikes me is that even in these soft moments where everything's kind of melancholy and it's kind of calmed down, there's still little flutterings of energy and little movements in different parts going along. And in particular moments, like I mentioned before, the contrast where it's all soft and all of a sudden, bam, it just hits you. So to me, one of the things, first of all, is some kind of you know, champagne that has that, that bubbling energy underneath, I thought was uh, particularly nice to, to complement what's happening in this symphony. You know, the, the energy just keeps on going. And uh, Dr. Hirschberg, you mentioned as well that Cliver is the only conductor you've ever heard do this. But when we get to the coda of this particular movement, he doesn't slow down, he keeps it going. So the energy is just ever uh, profound in there. And I'm enjoying that myself at this time. <laughs> Well, there, e even though uh, uh, champagne originates in France, there's something about champagne and Vienna uh, that definitely goes together, and it makes one think of, of uh, the, the Vienna, the Viennese folk song, you know. Wien, Wiener, du allein, so siehst du speed meine Träume sein, you know, uh, and, and Brahms was right in the middle of that. Now, now, Brahms was a very interesting character. He had a very, very sarcastic and sardonic personality. Uh, and he did not suffer fools gladly. Uh, he was very contemptuous of mediocrity, but he also loved to insult people. And he almost made a, a, a it was sort of almost a, a game 
And there was one gathering of, of a number of, of intellectuals where Brahms was present. And before he left, he turned as he was putting on his coat and he said, if there is anybody in this room that I failed to insult, I deeply apologize. <laughs> <laughs> So in keeping in the spirit of Beethoven, he found a way. Nine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'd just like to invite anyone at this point, if you have any questions for the presenters about the, the Brahms piece or, um, or, or anything that they've discussed this evening, if you would want to uh, just unmute yourself and ask the question or send it along in the in the chat screen and I'll pass it along too. So, um, so please feel free to do that. We did have to laugh because uh, when Dr. Hirschberger chose this piece of music, you know, we were thinking, okay, what's the cocktail that matches this particular piece of music? Both Patrick and I thought champagne, you know, there's a, there's a, an energy, a, a cheerfulness about champagne. You can't hear that piece of music without some somehow being joyful, mm -hmm. cheerful. There's a, there's a happiness that comes with it. And, and so Father Miller came up with this particular cocktail, which I think is pretty good. I like <laughs> it. I like it. Well, I was just thinking, as long as it's on the diocese dollar, I might as well ask for a glass of champagne. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Oh. oh, we didn't tell you yet. You're paying for it. <laughs> uh oh. We won't put that on the God's Gift video. That's right. We won't. Oh, yeah, don't do that. Now, come on, you all. Do not be Minnesota nice or North Dakota reserved. Uh, Fire away with your questions. How are things going on there? Up here in up here in Devil's Lake, Turnus family. Yes. Ah. We deviated slightly from the French seventy-five, and we went with the well-known common strawberry shake. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we found that it worked quite well. Equally joyful. Equally <laughs> joyful. That's that's the thing. And in the spirit of Brahms' embrace of nature in yeah. the symphony. Ah. Amen. That's right. That's right. Good for you guys. Good for you guys. <clears throat> you know, Jay, I was thinking back to, um, I remember we did a Brahms piece, you and I, a few years ago with our uh, Shanley High School Christmas concert. Yes, we did. The Geistly Kessli mm -hmm. from uh, a few years ago, Be yeah. Still. I know that I am God was the concert theme there. And I was just thinking about this because as we went through this symphony, you know, there was moments where there was just kind of, you know, one section does this and it's repeated by another. It's almost fugal and contrapuntal in, in different ways. And then I'm looking at the score here for the Geistic has lead. That's the exact same thing, but it's so melancholy and so soft and so much more of that Brahmsian character that we talked about that kind of seems to permeate a lot of his other type of music that's very calm and, and, and reserved in some ways. I thought that was a really interesting difference, especially as um, we talked about how the first symphony didn't work out so well for Brahms and the second symphony here, he comes up a lot more. It seems like a, a few people also, as I was doing my research, they said it was kind of a, the, the floodgates opened up for Brahms with this one. He just let the natural gift of music kind of flow in him. And I found that as an amateur composer myself, I find that when I labor over a piece of music for too long, I find that eh, maybe I should just scrap this and, and give it something else. But when I have a good piece, it takes me like a week. I can get it done in no time at all. It's quite remarkable. Well, since you brought that up, uh, we know for certain that Brahms was extraordinarily fastidious and uh, exacting and critical of his own compositions. And we know that a number of significant pieces of music that he wrote, he consigned to the flames yep. because he didn't, they, he didn't think that they, they met his they didn't standard. Measure up. They didn't measure up right. and they went right into the fireplace. It was just too bad. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, one, you know, if one had a time machine, maybe one could, could uh, <laughs> go back and stop him <laughs> and then, and then write a treatise on this, long lost piece of Brahms, uh, he probably wouldn't have appreciated it though, because he really did. He was very, very exacting. Uh, you know, a personal, you know, history anecdote. I, I was in the kindergarten when I heard my first Brahms symphony, and actually it was the Brahms first. 
And it was that symphony that caused me to want to be a musician. I, that, I walked out of the, of the, it was my first symphony concert that my parents took me to. And that, that uh, for Brahms, I, I just immediately went, oh, that's it. I got to be a musician. I can't believe it. And of course, all four of the symphonies now are, are, are beloved and amazing. I would encourage everyone, uh, we just showed you the fourth movement, but you could, you could go to YouTube and just uh, put in Cliver, K-L-E-I-B-E-R, Brahms Symphony Two, and you can watch all four movements. It's a marvelous performance, it really is. It's one of the great things that we have access to through YouTube. You know, you can listen to almost any piece of great music mm -hmm. On YouTube, and and I thought the same thing. I was just going to say that, don't just settle for that final movement that we shared with you. Listen to the whole thing. You know, it's maybe what do you think? Forty minutes, yeah. forty-five minutes all together. Forty minutes. Yeah. It's worth it's worth it. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I would also say that, you know, we commented a couple times that his first symphony was not a big success in his time. Right. But now, mm -hmm. you know, people hear it and they love it. And there is one particular. I think it's the the which movement is it that has a real familiar melody? Oh, the fourth the movement. Fourth movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has a familiar melody that everybody just loves. You'll you'll immediately recognize it, mm -hmm. and I hope that uh, you know you don't just eschew it because we've we've commented about the history of it. It's a great work. All of his works are. Do you have any thoughts about his sacred music? Do you yeah. want to talk any about about his sacred sure, music? Sure, absolutely. Of course, his most famous piece of sacred music was what is referred to as the Brahms Requiem. Uh, now, it was not based on the Requiem uh, Mass for the Dead. Brahms was probably an agnostic. Uh, we don't know much about uh, you know, how far his, his religious faith uh, was. I do believe that he was uh, baptized Catholic, um, but I don't, but don't, don't think he was, was practicing. However, his mother passed away. And this led him to really uh, engage the scriptures. And the Brahms Requiem is a seven movement work for choir, orchestra, and uh, vocal soloists. And all seven movements are drawn from scripture. Uh, it's they're just straight out of scripture. And um, uh, uh, whether it is uh, from the Beatitudes, which is the first movement, or probably the most familiar movement of, of the Brahms Requiem is the fourth movement, How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place, O Lord of Hosts. And it's one of the most wonderful moments in choral and orchestral literature. Really, really beautiful. And he, I mean, for someone who, who may have been an agnostic, he sure knew which scriptures to go to that talk about comfort and death and peace and uh, and eternal rest. It was, it's quite an amazing work. He, he wrote a number of, of uh, choral pieces uh, and choral preludes for organ based on uh, 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 German chorales. Uh, uh, Patrick, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the motets uh, anthems that he that he wrote. Um, I'm not as familiar with the, I, the one choral piece that I really know is mm -hmm. that Geist and mm -hmm. that we did. Mm -hmm. Um, which I thought is just phenomenal. And then, as you mentioned, somebody that's, you know, maybe considered an agnostic. One of the things that drew me to that song as I prepared that concert, I chose the theme, Be Still and Know That I Am God. But the tranquil manner in which it's written really suggests somebody that really has a, a grasp on that feeling. So whether or not he was particularly religious, it didn't seem to matter because when you read some of these texts, it just lends itself so perfectly to the style of music in which it should be written in. And Mozart's a great example of that too. You know, we, we look at his wonderful um, uh, Ave Verum Corpus, for example. It's a beautiful example of closer to the end of his life where he starts to kind of sober up, per se, uh, if you will, with his music. And I think Brahms kind of has the same style. Beyond that, I, I'll be honest, I'm not particularly familiar with that. It's one area of his music that I haven't known a whole lot about. I do know, you know about the choral preludes for organ. Um, and this this goes to just another general observation about uh, sacred music from composers in the in the Western canon who weren't necessarily practicing Christians, mm -hmm. but who nonetheless saw something in those texts. Whether um, well, well the, the Beethoven Misa Solemnis, one of the mm -hmm. great choral choral works, um, uh, 
the Berlioz Requiem, uh, the Verdi Requiem, um, uh, just uh, uh, these, these wonderful texts. Liszt, uh, who actually was a practicing Catholic and actually went through the four minor orders uh, of uh, ordination. Uh, I can't remember, so is he doorkeeper, uh, exorcist, lector, yeah, subde yeah, yeah. subdeacon? This was, this was before Vatican yeah. II. Maybe, I maybe I could just throw a question in here. Uh, I, I know I have some parishioners listening in. Here's a shout out to St. Cecilius and St. Peter's and Paul Yay. and Carl's group. And uh, so why are we talking about the, the finer details of classical music right now? Because it kind of was my idea that we do this. Um, what does it have to do with what we do in like a rural North Dakota parish uh, where maybe we can't do all the finer details of classical music? And um, what are the things that, that I, did that helped me a lot was music 101 in college. And what it did is it opened up how music works. It's like the, the different, um, you know, what a melody is and, and how you can paint with, with the text that, you know, you have a, uh, the, the, what, what's the, I got friends in low places. Um, uh, 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 Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks. And it's like, you know, when he says, sings low, the <clears throat> note is low. It's like, I never noticed that before. and. Uh, so that opened it up for me a little bit. So that was the idea with this is just to show that music is art. There is, when we learn more about art, we appreciate it more. And if we don't know about the art of it, then we can't appreciate it much. So we probably went like deeper than maybe some people wanted and not as deep as others wanted. But the point is that just open up the idea of music as art. And I want to just give you the chance now to kind of open up the floor of what are you thinking about? What's going on out there? Um, what's uh, what's happening in your parish? Um, what are your hopes and aspirations? What are your frustrations and desires? Um, you know, we don't, if you're not like real ready to talk about the finer details of symphonies, like I'm not either, I don't know. I know organ repertoire, I don't know symphonies. Um, but, but if there's other, you know, like the question, when are we gonna sing again? That's a good question. Um, we're not ready yet, but, but those are, Got questions like that you know unmute yourself and and just go ahead jump in jump in the free-for-all here um, go ahead we do have one question from the live chat and um it is what is it about a full church all singing the same hymn that seems to open up our souls to god to being uplifted to him because it doesn't seem like you get the same effect when singing alone for an emptier church mm -hmm. yeah yeah good well we you know when we returned to uh, public masses, uh, uh, the bishop graciously, you know, said, well, we don't want to be, you know, completely without music, so we can do organ and cantor. And you're right, there is something about organ and cantor that isn't the same as having the congregation sing. Uh, there, I think part of it is that uh, uh, as members of the body of Christ, there's that horizontal connection that we all have and when we sing uh, together and we sing a, a, a melody that everybody knows, you know, whether it's holy God, we praise thy name or, oh, God, beyond all praising or you name it. Uh, uh, there's something about that common and corporate expression that unifies us all, especially uh, when uh, the bishop says, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We are we're transported into the throne room, and we're joining the, the 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 saints and the angels in singing the praises of God. There, that kind of sense of, of corporate unity and fellowship, uh, it it has an effect on us, and in some ways, it's an effect that you can't. It's hard to explain with rational words. It's something that you have to experience. It's something that you. You, you know is happening and it, and it draws you in, but you can't necessarily write it down and, 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 and understand it, you know, uh, uh, like an engineer or a scientist would, would understand it. When you look in the liturgical documents of the church, it talks, there's a Musicum Sacrum, which I think was written in 1967 or something. It goes through what's most important to sing at Mass. You'll probably notice right now that we're actually not singing the most important thing <laughs> because they're the things we're all supposed to sing together and we're not supposed to all sing together because the epidemiologists say we're not supposed to sing together. Those darn guys that are 
Yeah, and, whatever. And, I, and uh, Father, I have to point out that... But those are the things that unify yes, us. That's most, right. And which is why we're feeling a longing for that kind of thing. And, Something is missing. And it's those moments, it's the, the ordinary, the Mass, the Sanctus, the, the, the Lamb of God, that we all know by heart. And we can sing it. We don't have to have music. Yeah. We, we, we could even do it just without a, a accompaniment. Somebody could start and everybody would join right in. Yeah. So when the epidemiologists say, oh, we probably ought not to be aerosoling everybody with COVID by singing, you know, we kind of have to say, okay, well, the, part that, the parts that everybody knows and can sing by heart, those are the parts we have to stay away from because people will sing if they're given the opportunity. And I have to, I have to kind of uh, uh, say that uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we, we had a small choir ensemble back at, at St. Mary's, but they sang just... Uh, the responsorial song, and we did an antiphon, and, and they did sing uh, uh, the, the verses to, to the hymn, so it was just the choir singing the hymn, but when we got to, oh God, beyond all praising, congregations are going to do what congregations do, <laughs> and, and they all sang, and there were shouts of glory and tears. Oh, yeah, so, you, you know, you, you can't help yourself. You, that's right, that's right, so, so, it's such a great question about singing and, and oh we're all just we're all just waiting for whatever needs to happen so that we can all do that exactly again i would add that you know there is also a, a unity in silence mm. um, there there's a, a spiritual power about silent prayer mm -hmm. you know if you've ever been in church with a whole church full of people and there's a, a, a moment where there's nothing else happening except silent prayer. That's a, an amazingly powerful experience as well. Um, you know, for instance, at the end of the prayers of the faithful, the universal prayers, when sometimes the celebrant or the, the reader will invite people to offer their own prayers in silence, you know, that, that silence in the church with, you know, hundreds sometimes, maybe a smaller group, but no matter how many are there, that silence itself has um, a, a, an impact on us. And frankly, you know, one of the, the challenges with the liturgy is not to just make it noisy. Right. You know, I think that the music that we celebrate or that we, that we, sing together the music that we um, share with the congregation is is really only powerful and only i would say spiritual if it's also balanced with moments of silence and the liturgy really has uh, a place for silence without that we lose the the power of the music then it just becomes one big noise after another and that's not what you want so so i guess i you know I, nobody loves music more than i do and i can hardly wait as i said before till the time when we can sing out loud again mm -hmm. you know i i mouth the words and it kills me not to mm -hmm. to sing them but um i think that 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 time of silence in the liturgy is really very very important mm -hmm. as well and uh you know father kramer i know you've studied the liturgy uh, in, in quite some depth, and I don't know if you have any thoughts that you want to share about that, but I, I do think that that's something that sometimes we forget. I think that there's a value to that. We don't need to fill every moment with sound. Uh, I'm going to interrupt. Thank you, Bishop. God bless you. Now I don't have to give my keynote address on silence tomorrow. You just <laughs> said what I was going to say. <laughs> How about that? Okay, yes. I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, no. The repetition <laughs> helps us to remember. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But I think what Bishop said of that there's a unity in silence is important. And um, I think musicians can help the priest in that. I remember as a little kid, my grandparents' pastor, we'd go to Mass there up in Our Lady of Mount Carmel by the Canadian border. And uh, and after the homily and after communion, I thought he just sat in the chair and went to sleep. And, uh, I was like, why is he, you know, is he that tired? He needs to take a nap. And, uh, and something, I, I try and do that as a priest. I try and have a moment of silence after the homily and after communion. I wonder if sometimes my prisoners are wondering if I took a nap. Mm -hmm. And so, but when 
when I have a church that's full of people that know how to pray and are praying, it's different. Mm -hmm. I, I go enter into prayer, they enter into prayer. And it's something to work towards, but I think musicians, I think are just, as, as Bishop had said in his little presentation, that it's, it's a ministry, it's a service to the people. And part of that service is helping them to praise God, but also helping them to enter into contemplation. And that's where the, the moments of silence are helping for. So I don't, it's not just gonna happen overnight, but I think if the musicians are with me, that helps if the more and more of the parish is, is with the priest in that prayer, um, there's unity in it. Uh, we're, we're praying together in silence. Some it, of you might remember the night that Pope Francis was elected as Pope. And he came out onto the balcony of St. Peter's. St. Peter's Square was filled with hundreds of thousands of people. <clears throat> and he came out, he was unknown to just about everybody. But one of the things he did in his first words to the people of the Diocese of Rome, but also to the world, he invited them all to pray silently. Do you remember that? And it was, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, for any of us who lived in Rome, that's pretty amazing. That kind of silence was re remarkable. And, you know, that enormous crowd in the piazza at St. Peter's <clears throat> was filled with people, but they were joined together in silent prayer. And it was really beautiful. I, I remember that very, very clearly. He, you know, his first words were, you know, buona sera, you know, good evening. He, he kind of won their hearts over immediately. Uh, but, but then he invited them to quiet prayer. And I think that that's, that should be part of our liturgy as well. Um, so the unity that we strive for through music, um, you know, we all know what that's like. We all know that experience, just the, the uplift that that brings about. But we shouldn't be uncomfortable with the silence of prayer that's also built into the liturgy as well. So uh, I, I just think that maybe, maybe now is the time to kind of uh, savor that. Um, even just go back to what Brahms did his symphony here. There are moments where all oh, of a yeah. sudden there's a random rest and it just stops for even for just a brief second. Yeah. That makes the re-entrance of the music so much more profound when it comes back because of the silence. The silence can really make the music better in those moments. Yeah, he brought it down to a whisper and then boom, you yeah. know, it, it goes. Yeah. It's, it's fun. In, in a sense, Silence itself is a form of music. Mm. If you think, uh, and I tell my students this, um, you know, because you, you, all of you who read music, you have notes and rests. Rests are silence. And for some reason, uh, we're uncomfortable with silence. And, and so my students oftentimes will, will cut the they'll short. cut the rest short or they'll even <laughs> ignore it completely. And, I, and so I have to say that, listen, listen, Rests are people too. <laughs> and and to, to get them to understand that silence is a part of what music is about. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow uh, 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 on the power of, of sacred silence. But if we think of, we start thinking about silence as music itself, it changes our ability to appreciate silence and to actually seek it. Any other uh, Where are we questions? Yeah, another question. Um, we've got a question about, um, kind of a liturgical question about the psalm. Um, is it appropriate to sing the psalm without the people responding, or would it be better just to speak it so that the people can respond? Um, kind of with the image of the bride and the bridegroom in conversation with each other as the church. Any thoughts on that? That's a good question. I've, I've seen it both ways, or I've heard it both ways. Um, sometimes the psalm is just spoken and the people do respond. Um, I'm also in, in the various masses that I've uh, celebrated around the diocese in these last few months. I've also heard where the, either the cantor or, you know, there's sometimes a little ensemble of singers. They're singing the psalm, but they're also inserting the, the refrain. Um, and it's interesting because the congregation sometimes will sort of uh, quietly um, 
repeat the refrain, which I think is great. I think that's good. I do it. You know, I, I mouth those words. I try not to sing out loud and follow my own rules, but, uh, but I do, I, you know, I think it can work either way. I, Father Kramer, what do you think? You're a liturgist here. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have the, the exact number of the documents, but I know you can sing it straight through. Sure. Yeah. Um, or you can use the, the response. You can either sing the response right away, go straight through. Both have their benefit, I would say, um, in that singing the response allows you to participate in a more external sort of way which might help you to, to interiorize it. I My parishes have been doing it straight through. And um, and I kind of, I've, I've found a benefit in it in that I'm paying more attention to the song mm -hmm. because it's not broken up. I, I, by, I guess I just find myself more attentive to it. So that's been the benefit of that for me right now. Yeah. I wouldn't say one way is it better than the other. I would say go, go by what your pastor has decided and um, you can give them a compelling argument for the other way, but at the end of the day, you probably better better uh, uh, do what do the way that he's asked to do it. So, but that doesn't mean you can't discuss it with him, and maybe maybe he'll change your mind if you're if he's convinced. Well, and the psalm is a response to the reading as well. You know, it doesn't demand that we do something. Sometimes it's just it's it's just appropriating receiving the words of that particular psalm as kind of a follow-up to the first reading. Usually the psalm is, is more tied to the first reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think you could make a case either way. I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. and I was going to add as well that in Music of Sacra, the document from Vatican II that talks about the sacred music and the mass and what we need to do with it in liturgy, it gives certain degrees for which, you know, importance. There's certain things that should be sung and you shouldn't sing, you know, for example, the, the Alleluia before the gospel before you sing certain other pieces and the psalm would fall into that liturgy of the word piece that really is primary. So as long as everything else is a congregation that we're not singing all together right now, it falls into that same first degree category where, you know, by the rubric, we're actually a little bit more accurate right now than we have been in most parishes for quite some time. And that's not a bad thing. Are you talking about the antiphons, like the introit and well, the offertory you know and the me. communion? <laughs> you know me, I do love me a good antiphon. Well, I tell you, I, I mean, I tell you, COVID is a perfect way for people to bring yes. those back in. I have to tattle on Bishop Folda uh, because he was talking about I try to follow my own rules. But Patrick, you'll remember Pentecost Sunday, mm -hmm. and uh, Bishop Folda was celebrating, and he got to the final doxology at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, and he started singing it. <laughs> and Patrick and I were both, we were both cantering, or I was playing organ, and he was cantering, but, but, but I got off the bench, and I looked at Patrick, and I said, we're going in, <laughs> and we turned the microphone on, and he finished, and we sang, Amen. And guess what? The congregation did too. <laughs> so, you know, that's people want to sing, you know, and, uh, and I said something to him afterwards. I said, hey, you know, you sang that, dude. And he said, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Couldn't help myself. It was just movement of the spirit. Right. Yes. All right. Um, another question is, why is choral music more common at mass? than orchestral or symphonic music? Good oh, question. It's a great question. Now, I wanna, I, that's, a, that's a, a, a kind of a, it's a, I don't wanna say it's a pet peeve of mine. Um, choral music, because it deals with text yep. and deals with the texts of, uh, oftentimes uh, a choir will actually sing uh, one of the readings, yep. one of the texts, right? Orchestral music was was designed for a certain kind of, of event, the concert hall. Uh, and as wonderful as it might be to think about having a, a Brahms symphony movement played as a postlude <laughs> at, a, at a mass, it I, my personal opinion is, is that it, it, it's that's not the place for that. Um, I, I'm a pianist by training and I teach. And neither would I want to play, for example, a, a, a list etude or a really fancy classical piece of music uh, during mass, uh, because that the, the emphasis there is on the music and tangentially on the performer. 
themselves. And that can take us away from our focus on Jesus Christ. And, and that's one of the big important aspects of church music is that it should point us to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that, for example, you might have an orchestra play along with the choir, the Mozart Ave Verum Corpus, because it was originally written for, for orchestra. Um, maybe some of you are aware of St. Agnes Parish in the Twin Cities, uh, which is a, a very, very uh, wealthy parish, and they have a, a, a full uh, orchestra and choir, and they perform, uh, they actually sing uh, classical composer, com uh, composed masses uh, at Sunday Mass, Schubert, Mozart, Haydn, uh, Beethoven. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's quite the deal, and, and, and it, it has actually attracted a, a number of people in the Twin Cities who, who otherwise would never go to church, uh, some of whom have, have even become Catholic as a result of it. So it's, been, it's, a, it's a real evangelistic tool. But, you know, it's not practical in most parishes, and that's the thing. And that's what's most important, is that what's practical for most parishes is really what's at the forefront of the mind of the church when it comes to setting up how music should work. It should be a universal church, as we are Catholic. And so the first primary thing is the voice and the singing, as you mentioned earlier. It's about the text. And to Father Kramer's point earlier, too, you know, even Garth Brooks, you know, like, I got friends in low places, the voice goes low. A lot of the music that's written, liturgically speaking, follows along with what the words of the text are. Are. And so it's built upon what the words are, and that's what's of primary importance. Because when you talk about the liturgy, liturgy, you're talking about a holistic, comprehensive view of the readings, the antiphons that work together to give you this message that's really binded, and it really fits together really nicely. So when you do all that together, it just works. This is a great challenge for any composer of an orchestral piece, or I'm an organist, so I always think in terms of organ, mm -hmm. but. The text is primary, and the reason for the text is that it's the words of Christ. It's the words of the church in response to Christ. So the, the, the liturgy is made up of words, it's made up of, of gestures, it's made up of the elements of bread and wine and water and oil, and, um, and all these things are, are very important. And the words, you know, without the words, these other signs mean nothing. You know, with the, the bread and the wine, without the words, don't do anything. Water, the, the water without the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Don't mean it, doesn't mean anything. So, so the words are very important, and that's what the, the music has to be based on. Um, so that doesn't mean that instrumental music can't happen. No. I think right. that it, yeah, it's, right. it can be totally appropriate, but it's a matter of, is it a musical meditation on the words of the liturgy, or is it elevator music? Elevator music, we don't want. A musical meditation on the words of Christ on a liturgical text, absolutely. And so that's the great challenge for, for any artist is how do I, you know, it's an expression of one's own prayer and it's an expression of the universal prayer of the church. Um, and in a certain sense, you know, just as, you know, Brahms or any other composer, they rely upon inspiration. It's, the, you know, they don't just sit down and decide this is going to happen. It has to flow. And likewise, with the church composer, the Holy Spirit has to be involved in, in bringing it about. Now, I would also add, too. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I would also add, too, you know, we always run the risk of falling into performance. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that orchestral or just pure instrumental music maybe contend that way even a little bit more. That's not necessarily true, because that can happen with vocal or choral music as well. I mean, you know, you can have a... A vocalist and an instrumentalist who are performing more than they're uh, leading liturgical music. So I think that's just always a, a little bit of a, uh, a risk that we run with sacred music is that we fall into the, the mode of performance rather than prayer. And exactly. you know, even, even with you know, the great uh, choral music that happens at St. Agnes in, in the, the Archdiocese. I think that they have a very, very strong spirituality of their music, mm -hmm. but it's not enough just to have great music. It needs to be prayer. It needs mm -hmm. to be integrated into the liturgy. And, you know, I would say that for any of our parish musicians as well, you know, always, always ask yourself, am I just doing this because I like this piece of music or am I doing this mm -hmm. because 
it really is a prayerful part of the liturgy and then is it integrated with the liturgy is it somehow serving the liturgy rather than just it's a song that everybody likes or it's a song that i like you know that's always a question yep all right we've got one more question and then we're, we'll wrap it up for the evening um the question is are there any other Brahms pieces that the uh, presenters would recommend <laughs> oh uh, any of the opus numbers uh, uh. <laughs> Well, um, uh, I would encourage uh, the, you to listen to either, um, he, uh, he wrote four concertos for uh, solo instruments and orchestra, two piano concertos, uh, a violin concerto, and then actually a concerto for violin and cello and orchestra, which is really wonderful. If, if any of you are old enough to remember back in the 60s, as the world ends, the uh, opera. Uh, the theme to As the World Turns in the 60s was the second movement of the Brahms double concerto for violin and, and, and cello. But those are wonderful, wonderful pieces. Uh, his chamber music, his piano music, he, he was, uh, I, I don't think there's a bad opus number in, in, in any of the things that he did. And one choral work I'll throw out there right away is obviously the Shisas Lied. It was one of his best, and one of his biographers even said that if he wrote nothing else but the Shisas Lied, he still would have been considered one of the greatest composers, like a Berlioz with Symphony Fantastique, where he just kind of has the one big hit. But the Shisas Lied is just kind what, of uh, what, what, What's the translation of that uh, German? Uh, ah, Google it. It is Google the Song it. of Destiny. Do Song of Song Destiny. Of Destiny. Oh. I was thinking, how am I gonna, how am I gonna Google that? My German, <laughs> not good. I, 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 I want to kind of riff on something that Bishop said uh, when he, when he talked about performing. I think, mus church musicians are safe from that tension of performance if they have this attitude in asking themselves at mass when I am providing the music, whether it's a conductor for the choir or organist or accompanist or cantor, who am I performing for? If I am performing for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if that is my focus in doing my best because they are the divine audience uh, and I wish to offer that as, as a sacrifice of praise. Remember that King David said, I will not offer that to God, which costs me nothing. So when we when we really play skillfully or sing skillfully, I mean, he doesn't say make a joyful noise unto the Lord, uh, play mediocrely on an instrument of ten strings. He says play skillfully. But the point is, is that our 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 performing should be directed to God as an act of, of worship and praise. And if we do that, then we take the focus off of ourselves. And, and even off of the music itself, and we draw draw people into greater devotion and, 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 and piety toward the Lord. I'll take a line from uh, Cindy Hazelton over at St. Santa Joachim, the great church uh, choir director over there. Before just about every single piece that we ever sing at Mass, you'll see her do a little gesture like this. And that tells us, as she says in rehearsal, every single week, pray this piece before every single song we sing. Pray this piece. So it's intentional that we're all in prayer together, offering this to the Lord for the benefit of the con congregation, the edification of the faith. J.S. Uh, um, uh, Bach, the great uh, German composer from the Baroque era, every single piece of music that he wrote, whether it was sacred music or orchestra music or keyboard music, he wrote J.J. Uh, at the top, which was uh, Jesus Juva, Jesus help me. And then at the bottom, he wrote S D G, Soli Deo Gloria. He, everything he wrote, he, he aimed it right at God. It didn't matter whether it had words or not. Well, Soli Deo Gloria, by the way, means to God alone be the glory. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on that note, I think we probably should wrap it up tonight. And uh, I want to thank Bishop Fold, especially for being here with us tonight. I appreciate Glad that, that you were able to join uh, the musicians, the diocese. I know it's a, I know I was Bishop Fold, the secretary for five years, and I know that he very much appreciates the work that you do as musicians in the, uh, out in the parishes. And uh, 
I want to thank Dr. Hirschberger, who you'll hear more from tomorrow, uh, Mr. McGuire tomorrow, Father Miller, who, um, who uh, basically did everything to make this organized, um, and, uh, kept everyone on track. And so um, I also want to thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, um, I hope you're able to sign on all right tomorrow. And uh, if, if there's any problems, um, just email. Uh, you can email Tamara and then it'll say she's not going to be here tomorrow and that you got to talk to Father Jason and they'll have his email in there. So, so email Father Miller um, if you have any problems um, getting on and we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. If not, call the diocese 701-356-7900 and, uh, and we'll answer the phone and try and help you get on. And if you know of anyone else that's struggling to get on, just, just let us know and we'll try and make it work. So I uh, just want to make, uh, make one kind of announcement. We will be recording the talks. Um, so if you can't be here tomorrow, or if you have to be away for a little while, um, check back on the diocese. We're going to do our best to, uh, to get those up soon after the workshop is over. Um, and, uh, and so that's going to, that's going to be, be up there. Also check the web, the web page for the schedule for who's speaking when. That will all be up there. Um, we start at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not even at full strength yet. I know that's hard to believe, but uh, we're still waiting for Jeremy and Angela Schmaltz to come. They're going to be here tomorrow and they're going to give an awesome talk. Um, so we hope that you can all join us back tomorrow. If you can't, um, check the website for the recorded talk. So um, Bishop, would you close us with, uh, with the prayer? I will be glad to. Let me just say a word of thanks to all of you who are participating this evening and who will be uh, participating tomorrow as well. Um, you just have, you have my admiration and my gratitude for all you do in your own parishes. Um, I have the blessing of being able to visit parishes all across the diocese. I know how hard our musicians and our uh, singers work and how much they give of themselves to give glory to God. So. Uh, I'm so grateful. I really am. And uh, you do such good work. And it's all again for God's glory. Thank you for that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, you've given us the capacity to praise you with song, with music, with our voices, with our hearts. We ask you to fill us with your grace so that we might always give glory to you. And through that gift of song and music, we might draw others to experience your love, your grace in their lives. May we always be instruments in your hands so that we might draw others to experience your love for them. These and all our prayers we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thanks, everybody. Hey, we'll see you at 9 o'clock with your cup of coffee tomorrow for a great day.